that was quite an introduction. <clears throat> so it's quite an honor to be giving the 29th annual Dodder Lecture. Charles Dodder was without a doubt an incredibly gifted individual. He either worked on or predicted much of what we do in interventional radiology today, only a little bit of what's shown on this slide. He was known for his overriding philosophy, which certainly resonates with me, keep things simple. My bet is that Charles Dodder wouldn't be at all surprised at where interventional radiology is in 2013, at how much things have changed in the 50 years since he practiced. Lots more about change in the next few minutes. When Marshall asked me to give the 29th annual Dodder Lecture last July, my first thought was, what in the world can I talk about that wouldn't embarrass me in front of my family, my friends, and my colleagues? Like any self-respecting academic, my first move was to research the previous 28 Dodder Lectures. I read through as many of them as I could. Unfortunately, some of them haven't been captured for posterity, but most were. The list of luminaries who've given this previous daughter lecture was indeed impressive. Unfortunately, that just made me feel worse. I found out that the first daughter lecture was given in 1985, at the, at, uh, uh, the year I finished my residency. It was given by the venerated Professor Eberhard Zeitler, and the title fitting the first daughter lecture was Overview of Angioplasty. The meeting that year was held in Orlando, Florida. And the registration was over 300 professionals interested in the burgeoning field of cardiovascular and interventional radiology, as it was called back then. The highlight of the meeting was the first of many yearly debates on how much the society should grow. Should the status quo be maintained? Should a small group, 25 to 75 new members, be added? Or should the membership be open to all radiologists who practiced interventional radiology more than 50% of the time? At that meeting, the crucial decision was made to open up the membership and evolve from what was formerly a club to a true professional society. I then thought back on my first SCVIR meeting in 1987, when the third annual Dodder Lecture was Stanley Baum. Stan talked about the interventionalist impact on the practice of radiology. That year, the meeting was in San Diego, and the membership had grown to 532, 532 members at the meeting. The membership of the society was more than 500 in just two years. And that was the first meeting where a formal membership dues structure was established. Just my good fortune to miss out on all the free years. How in the world did I get from my first SCVIR meeting to the point where I was being asked to give one of our society's most prestigious lectures? Things sure change quickly, and that got me to thinking about change and how sometimes it really does seem like things change in the blink of an eye. I thought I'd Google that phrase, blink of an eye, and see what came up. One of the first entries that came up was a link to a Star Trek episode where the Starship Voyager is drawn into the orbit of a planet that's rotating 58 times a minute. Down on the planet, time passes so rapidly that the crew of the orbiting Voyager sees the entire evolution of the planet during the course of their visit. Drama ensues, antimatter attacks, speeches full of angst, lots of hostage taking, a typical day for most of us in interventional radiology. Finally, in classic Star Trek fashion, all is resolved and the ship moves on to other adventures. I wondered if this could be construed as a metaphor for those of us who are tasked with giving these weighty lectures. As we get further on in our careers and look back, it really does seem at times like the Earth's been rotating 58 times a minute all of a sudden, things really do look like they've changed in the blink of an eye. Change has been a big theme of the Dodder Lectures over the years. Most Dodder Lectures have change as a theme uh, or even change as the whole topic. Will IR continue or disappear? Will IR evolve into something different? Or will interventional radiology leave radiology entirely? Change is also the theme of the tipping point. Malcolm Gladwell's well-known book about how change happens. Gladwell's book discusses how change often happens in a big hurry and typically in dramatic fashion. He points out that we need to prepare ourselves for the fact that sometimes big changes follow from small events and that these changes can happen very, very quickly. Gladwell famously describes the tipping point 
as that time when everything changes all at once. Well, I decided it'd be interesting, at least interesting to me, to take the occasion of this daughter lecture to put together my top 10 list of changes that have occurred in interventional radiology over the last 27 years. Looking at those changes from the vantage point of a Star Trek, or an orbiting Star Trek Voyager and see what we can learn about change. So here we go. Here's my top 10 list of what I think are the most important changes in interventional radiology over the last 27 years. Number 10, ultrasound-guided internal jugular vein access, or sometimes the best ideas are right behind you. You just need to look around. I know you're thinking at this point, what kind of top 10 list starts with something as mundane as ultrasound-guided internal jugular vein access? But really, how many IR procedures have their own TV commercials? I'm not sure how many of you have actually seen this commercial on TV, but if you're still struggling with that eternal question of how to explain to your mom, to your next door neighbor, or the person sitting next to you on an airplane what an interventional radiologist does, I'd highly recommend you, you show them this iTube video, this YouTube video. This actually looks like our typical IR group at MIR, fresh from morning rounds, <laughs> and ready to tackle the first case of the day. Although I'm not sure what that guy in the middle is wearing around his neck. It looks like some sort of antiquated medical instrument. <laughs> anyway, when we first started trying to get access to the internal jugular vein, it was a real ordeal. The surgical literature talked about landmarks through the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The radiology literature talked about using fluoroscopic landmarks that I remember Marshall tried to explain to me that I never understood using the pillars of the cervical vertebral body. There were lots of reports of complications, pneumothorax, carotid artery puncture, Horner's syndrome. And unfortunately, I remember one patient in our practice who we were trying to do a varicocele embolization on who got all three. We would literally spend an hour trying to get access to the internal jugular vein, and sometimes we were simply not successful and had to abandon the entire procedure. In the early 1990s, the interventional radiology literature began to report ultrasound guidance for internal jugular vein puncture. Clearly, folks just needed to look at the problem differently. After all, venous access is just an abscess drainage into a blood vessel. We already had the ultrasound machines right next to us in the IR suites. This led to the amazing growth of all sorts of procedures that we performed through the internal jugular vein. But most importantly, it led to the complete takeover of venous access by interventional radiology. Many consider venous access somewhat mundane, but it's a service that supports many interventional radiology practices. Venous access is an area where we as interventional radiologists have made tremendous impact on patient care, literally changing the field for the better by providing a unified service where virtually no patient leaves the IR suite without a properly functioning vascular access device. No longer do, we have to go to the, no longer do patients have to go to the operating room uh, leading to tremendous savings for the healthcare system, which nobody seems to want to talk about. Gladwell talks about a stickiness factor. In order for an idea to be significant, it must have that spark that makes it clear to everyone how important it is. The idea of ultrasound guidance for venous access was definitely sticky. Once introduced, it was immediately clear to everyone how important it was. Lots of ideas in interventional radiology are like this. And as a specialty, we're quick to embrace change. Interventional radiologists are what Gladwell calls innovators and early adopters. And this is truly one of the key strengths of our discipline. Number nine, technology changes everything. Big toys, better ways to image patients. Here are a couple pictures of one of the early angiographic suites at the Malincrod Institute of Radiology and one of my neuroradiology colleagues, Mukhtar Gatto. It's hard to imagine how we could do any of what we do uh, in this type of facility. Contrast that with this picture of my partner, Mike Darcy, working in one of our new angiography suites. The revolution in the way we image patients for interventional radiology procedures has been nothing short of amazing. Perhaps no change has been more important than the widespread adoption of digital subtraction angiography. DSA allows rapid image review. Gone are the days when we'd stand by the processor waiting for the films to drop out one at a time, only to find out that our catheter kicked out of the artery and we'd have to do the run all over again. DSA provides the diagnostic, our ability to get diagnostic information with small amounts of dilute contrast. 
It also enables us to design new CRMs without bulky film changers and allows us to digitally store our image and perform image manipulation, all things critically important to modern interventional radiology. It's incredible to think about how much harder it'd be to do something like a chemoembolization, something we do every day without digital subtraction angiography. Number eight, technology changes everything, little toys, new, to, new tools open doors to diagnosis and treatment. When I trained, we were still using a steam kettle to shape and make our own specialty catheters. As described by Ann Roberts in her 2004 Dodder lecture, Dodder made his first guide wires using modified guitar strings, VW speedometer cables, and even intercom wires that he fished out of the trash and stripped the insulation off of. I'm pretty sure, but not positive, that he would have had trouble getting those by the FDA. There have been tremendous changes in the tools available to those of us doing IR over the last 20 years, or 30 years. Now we have a host of new tools that allow us to do things like stint-assisted aneurysm repair and actually reline blood vessels. New tools include hydrophilic coatings for guide wires and catheters, microcatheters, microwires, dozens of new embolic materials, and many more on the way, low-profile filters, stints, and stint grafts, as well as a host of percutaneous ablation devices for RF, cryo, and microwave. All these tools have allowed a multitude of new procedures and techniques that were impossible when I did my fellowship. Number seven. Collaboration is not always good, the loss of peripheral vascular disease. While we've been very successful as a specialty, adding many new facets to our practices, the loss of peripheral vascular disease has been a huge change for most of us. As vascular surgery and cardiology became interested in endovascular procedures, many of us tried collaboration. In 1997, at Washington University, we tried a joint venture with our vascular surgery colleagues and optimistically reported on how we hoped to find a new paradigm to provide care to patients with peripheral vascular disease. We even presented our results at the 1999 SCVIR annual meeting. Two years later, in the year 2000, our partnership dissolved due to irreconcilable differences regarding who would do what procedures where. Unfortunately, we found out that while interventional radiology had lots to share, it didn't turn out to be a two-way street. This really did change in the blink of an eye. Overnight, after our agreement was severed, we lost almost our entire portfolio of peripheral vascular patients. Gladwell talks about the power of context. He says that epidemics of change are exquisitely sensitive to the circumstances and times of the places in which they occur. The conditions and circumstances of the late 1990s clearly led to an epidemic of change for most interventional radiology practices when it came to interventions for peripheral vascular disease. Our almost 100% dependence on, vascular surgery on our vascular surgery colleagues for patient referrals, coupled with national pressure for vascular surgeons to provide endovascular therapies, along with the recruitment of younger surgeons to our practice in Washington University who weren't satisfied doing old-fashioned surgery, combined to change our practice overnight, a real tipping point. More than a few interventional radiologists are still treating patients with peripheral vascular disease, and there's good work being done by the SIR in trying to enlarge that group. But by and large, that battle's lost. Many battles still lie ahead, and we need to work hard to maintain our clinical practices and, most importantly, control our own, base, our own direct patient referral streams. Which leads me directly to number six, I think. There we go. The rise of the true clinical interventional radiologist or the universal recognition of, of the importance of clinical skills. Dodder, as in many things, predicted we would lose all of interventional radiology if we did not adopt the clinical responsibilities attendant with being a doctor to patients. Almost every Dodder lecture has discussed the importance of interventional radiologists taking a clinical role. But I think it was perhaps covered most eloquently by Gary Becker in his 1999 Dodder lecture, where he gave the specialty a grade of C minus for our commitment to clinical medicine and strongly urged the adoption of full fledged IR clinical services. This was certainly a lesson I learned early on during my fellowship with Barry Katzen and Irina Van Breda, who practically invented the idea of interventional radiologists admitting patients to the hospital. 
Of course, Barry and Arena had great fellows taking care of all their scut for them. I believe there's been much progress made in this front, and I now give the specialty a grade of B. Most successful IR practices have embraced the idea of inpatient services, IR clinics, and consults, and all agree that this is the only way to preserve our specialty going forward. Number five, new roles for non-physician members on the IR team. We hired our first nurse coordinator at Washington University in 1996 at the urging of my then partner, Marshall Hicks. Marshall had the vision that for our group, our nurse coordinator would make us more efficient. Of course, I was at first skeptical, but now we have 10 of these people working to and contributing to our IR practice. We've got physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, nurse coordinators, medical assistants, and believe it or not, we had to hire our own pre-certification assistant recently. We couldn't run our practice without these folks. As healthcare continues to evolve, they'll become increasingly critical members of the interventional radiology team. We need to carefully assess the roles that these individuals uh, can fill and where each provides the most value. Number four, the realization that the tools we use can be dangerous. Interventions to decrease radiation dose and the movement for quality in interventional radiology. This is a very important topic for both our patients and for us as radiation workers. There have been major changes in our approach and understanding of these issues which have influenced how we perform interventional radiology procedures. Changes in shielding, the use of pulsed fluoro, last image hold, road mapping and saved fluoro runs all have contributed to our ability to decrease the dose that we, provide, that we, uh, that we uh, expose patients to. There's no question that interventional radiologists are best positioned to lead this effort because of our training in and understanding of radiation physics. In our practice, primarily through the hard work of my partner Jim Duncan, we've been able to decrease our radiation dose significantly through a series of focused interventions and feedback to the IR group using basic PQI principles. Here's a typical run chart generated by Jim and his team showing the results of a series of interventions in the fall of 2011 to change our standard imaging protocols. Not only have we been able to significantly decrease our average dose, but most importantly, we've been able to sustain those changes over the long run. It's important to recognize that not just our patients benefit from these interventions. We've also seen a significant decrease in the radiation badge readings from both the radiologists and the technical staff as we decrease our dose overall. In addition, we've taken a proactive role in educating our patients on this very important topic. And here are a couple of, of the educational materials that Jim and his team at MIR have put together to help with patient education. Number three, documentation is not always good. The increase in the number and length of the forms that were required to fill out before, during, and after interventional radiology procedures seems to be increasing logarithmically every month. There's no question that documentation is important and serves a useful function, but I'm convinced that the proliferation of what feels like documentation for documentation's sake will eventually cause the entire system to grind to a halt. It's a true miracle that somehow, some way, we could practice interventional radiology in the old days with so, much, so many fewer forms to fill out. One of the early pioneers of aviation was Donald Douglas, one of the founders of McDonnell Douglas Aviation, a very important St. Louis company. He too was frustrated by the overwhelming amount of paperwork required before a new aircraft could be certified to fly. He coined what has widely been, called, what has widely been quoted as the Douglas Law of Practical Aeronautics. Only when the weight of the paperwork equals the weight of the plane will the plane be ready to fly. I'd like to offer the Picus Law of Practical 21st, medicine, 21st Century Medicine. Only when the weight of the paperwork equals the weight of the patient are we allowed to start the procedure. And those of you who are familiar with the size of our typical patients truly understand how high this bar is. Number two, the death of component coding or the government is not our friend. In the good old days, under Medicare as originally implemented, the first practitioner to bill for a, a procedure established the usual and customary fee, the UCF. 
Believe it or not, Medicare would then actually pay 80% of that fee. Unfortunately, setting fees was a low priority for most of the early interventional radiology physicians who were primarily interested in the techniques and technology of interventional radiology. Thus, IR procedures were typically money losers for most radiology practices. Around 1990, Medicare switched to the RBRVS, the Resource-Based Relative Value Scale. All medical procedures were given a numeric value or an RVU, a relative value unit, to reflect the physician work in comparison to all other procedures. An interesting little factoid is that all radiology procedures were actually compared to an intravenous urogram, a procedure we don't even perform any longer, which was given an RVU of 1.0. The RVS Update Committee, or the RUC, was established as a group to, to value procedures going forward. As, of the part of the, as part of the migration to an RVU-based payment system in 1991, as a result of an enormous effort by the SIR, thanks to the hard work of folk, folks like Gary Dorfman, Bob Vogelzang, and others, there was a total revision of almost all IR CPT codes. More than 100 complete procedure codes were deleted and replaced by an ingeniously designed series of component codes that were used in a building block fashion to describe the work of interventional radiology. This then was the birth of interventional radiology component coding. These new codes were all accepted as a group by both CPT and RUC. I'm not sure if you can appreciate what an amazing accomplishment this was and one that would never be possible in today's toxic reimbursement environment. This assured that all interventional radiology procedures were finally recognized and appropriately valued going forward. Component coding had major advantages besides just uh, improved reimbursement. Using a small set of building block codes, a vast array of complex catheter-based diagnostic and interventional procedures could be described. It also sparked innovation, since it provided the flexibility to describe both new procedures and new applications of, old, of existing procedures without having to continually go back for new CPT codes. Fast forward to 2006. There was widespread criticism by organizations like MedPAC, and the GAO that too many dollars were being spent on medical care, especially imaging services. In response, the RUC established the RAW, the Relativity Assessment Work Group, which was tasked with identifying potentially misvalued services. The RAW developed a series of screens to look for CPT codes that were misvalued, read overvalued. One big screen was services reported frequently together. The idea being, if services are always reported together, there's likely significant overlap in the work and thus the possibility and savings uh, in terms of lesser reimbursement. The mandate was to redo CPT coding for all of the services reported frequently together. And oh, by the way, you need to bring the entire family of codes back to the RUC for revaluation. Unfortunately, the trip back to the RUC for new valuation always led to decreased valuation. Well, the first screen was for services performed greater than 90% of the time together. And for some reason, the two codes caught in this screen were dialysis access and percutaneous cholecystostomy. Not too bad. It also caught CT of the abdomen and pelvis, which was a huge change for diagnostic radiology, as well as the entire family of cardiac catheterization codes. So for those of you who think that just radiology is pick being picked on, uh, all of cardiac catheterization codes had to go back and really caused a seismic shift for interventional cardiology. Seeing how well this 90% screen worked, CMS implemented the next screen. Services performed greater than 75% of the time together. Not surprisingly, this screen netted the vast majority of IR component codes. As new component codes were, as new bundled codes, I'm sorry, were developed, they all had to be revalued by the RUC. In all cases, these bundled codes came out reimbursed at significantly lower levels. Lower extremity revascularization saw a drop of 30 to 40 percent in reimbursement. IVC filters, a whopping 75 percent drop in reimbursement. And the new carotid angiography codes, the new bundled codes for diagnostic carotid angiography that were just implemented January 1st, are predicted to show up to a 30 to 40 percent decrease in reimbursement. So far, these efforts by the RAW have resulted in about $1.5 billion being redistributed from radiology to other specialties for Medicare patients alone. 
This process is moving quickly, and very soon the entire coding paradigm for interventional radiology will be back to complete procedure codes, potentially leaving many IR procedures again as revenue losers for radiology practices. A huge change in many ways, but one that brings us back full circle to where IR started. Talking about where we started leads me to number one on my list of major changes in interventional radiology since I started 27 years ago. As I shared earlier in this talk, my first SIR meeting was in 1987 in San Diego. I can still remember how exciting it was to meet so many of the very important field, the people who were the true giants of interventional radiology at the time. Candidly, just finishing my IR fellowship, I also remember thinking how old all those people looked to me. I felt like the youngest person at that meeting. This then has been the number one biggest change in interventional radiology for me. Looking around the room today, I see a huge change in that the folks who've been practicing IR along with me, today's true giants of interventional radiology, don't look so old now at all. In fact, we really look young as far as I'm concerned. I don't think we look any different, do you? Things really do change in the blink of an eye. So that's my list. I'm sure each of you would make a different list, but hopefully there'd be some overlap. While all of these changes are clear in retrospect, it's important to remember that it's hard to understand change and what it all means when you're in the middle of the chaos. My grandson Noah is definitely an expert in chaos. It's only with the perspective of time that we can make sense of the chaos and understand what's good and bad about all the changes that are constantly swirling around us. Despite all the doom and gloom lately, as the society enters its 40th year, I do feel that the future of IR remains bright. Although without a doubt, we're at what we, we would have to consider a major tipping point in healthcare. What interventional radiologists do every day in so many different ways adds so much value to healthcare that it's inevitable that interventional radiology will continue to flourish and prosper. Perhaps we'll get, less pay, we'll get paid less going forward, but so will all of our other clinical colleagues. As the rest of diagnostic radiology struggles with issues of commoditization brought on by teleradiology and Nighthawk services, the hands-on nature of interventional radiology will continue to make us irreplaceable members of the healthcare team. We do need to clearly recognize that this requires a very real commitment to clinical medicine and never lose sight of how important it is to see patients in clinic, to make rounds on the ward, and to be seen as a true clinical colleague. I'd like to thank the leadership and members of the SIR for the privilege of giving the 29th Annual Dotter Lecture. I'm personally so grateful to have been able to positively impact the lives of so many of my interventional radiology patients over the years, from something as simple as placing a port in a patient starting the long journey back from the diagnosis of cancer, to something as complex as embolizing a pulmonary AVM in a patient who has a brain abscess. IR is truly a great specialty, and if I had to do it all over again, I absolutely would. What hasn't changed for me is that interventional radiology remains a ton of fun, always an intellectual and increasingly a physical challenge, and an everyday opportunity to help people. What interventional radiologists do every day is truly amazing. That hasn't changed one bit over the last 27 years, and I don't think it ever will. Thank you very much.